Welcome to the Cocktail Guru Podcast. A show about food, drink, and entertainment. With a tight focus on the good life. And all things delicious, luxurious, and fun. I'm Jonathan Pogash, bartender, author, TV personality, and founder of The Cocktail Guru. And I'm Jeffrey Pogash, wine and spirits professional, author, insatiable collector of culinary ephemera, and so people tell me, an engaging raconteur. And my dad. It's hot. Okay. I'm hot. I'm very, it, very warm. Uh, it's, it's very warm where I am, Man. too, but it's glorious because it gives us a tropical feel. That's right. To, to this podcast. We're, I mean, we're episode. I'm in I'm in New England. You're in New Jersey, and there might as well be palm trees out. Uh, well, right it's ni- ninety around ninety degrees. Oh here. my god! So that's pretty good. Um, yeah, that's pretty good. But are you? Um, I don't have a cocktail today because I'm kind of. You know when when um it's warm outside and you're just kind of like the you get you're you, lethargic yeah, I'm, yes I'm, and you don't really want to do you just want to lounge around and you yeah. don't necessarily want an alcoholic beverage yes yes I plus understand. we're going we're going away with the family um this weekend to california um oh for those of you who are interested um i just completed a bar consulting project in uh carlsbad california which is north of um san diego it's called Alejandra's. It's a new Mexican restaurant. So if you're out there, go and say that Jonathan sent you and you can have a delicious Alejandra's margarita and some nice uh, agave spirits. Well, John, I really got creative with this drink today. Normally I don't. I try to, I tend to follow recipes and I, uh, you know, don't necessarily come up with my own concoctions on a regular basis. But today because this is Polynesian, because it's tropical, and and we are both tiki people, you and I, <laughs> I decided to really get creative, and I played around, and I read some recipes that our guest created for his bar, and some of the ingredients inspired me a bit. So what I did was I put an ounce and a half of an overproof rum mm into this glass. I mixed it with an ounce of white rum, an ounce of coconut spiced rum, and about a half an ounce of, believe it or not, chartreuse. (laughs) Can you you pronounce it? Chartreuse. Chartreuse. Okay, thank you. Chartreuse. (laughs) And then I um, um, added another, about a quarter of an ounce of slow gin mm. and i put some pumpkin spice oh my gosh. syrup Jeez. in here just to give it a little bit of sweetness because i felt it needed that's a that. lot that's a lot and, the and garnish... then i top and Go i ahead. topped it off hold on i topped it off with some tonic yeah okay tonic Jeez, water this is like a hot and the garnish and the garnish for those people who can't see at home is a hot dog no what is that? A, a it's, banana? It's a banana. <laughs> because that's what I had available at hand. I always have bananas. So okay. Well, I I, we need to bring on in... A, we, on a spear. We need to bring yes, in our well, guests. Because, well, let because me take a sip of this first. I was I was inspired um, when I went to visit uh, his bar, Three Dots in a Dash, in Chicago. I uh, was inspired to mimic the garnish preparation uh, at that bar because I believe... I'm not mistaken. They do a really adorable dolphin um, garnish with a uh, half banana and little flippers. And maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Hmm. Um, but uh, in any case, um, I think we should bring him in. What, what do you think, Dad? Well, yes, but because uh, this gentleman is the um, director of Three Dots and a Dash, and he's also the beverage director for... Um, the bamboo room, which is part of three dots and a dash, but that is the more rum centric portion of three dots and a dash, even though there's rum everywhere in the bar, they have an incredible selection, which I'm sure he will talk about. Um, three dots and a dash. Of course, the name is, if I may say, inspired by Dom, the beachcomber. Um, our next guest is, has been in the bar business for a while and he's been in the hotel business and he is a consummate uh, mixologist and bartender. His um, bar is part of a group called Let Us Entertain You, which is a true restaurant and bar empire. 
And uh, his name is Kevin Beery, beverage director for Three Dots and a Dash and the Bamboo Room. And, and we're going to bring him in and we're going to bring him in in a quick second. In just a second. Want to explore those craft and small batch spirits you can't find at your local liquor store and then have them shipped directly to your doorstep? The folks at Tipsy, lovers of craft beverages of all sorts, searched the web but couldn't find a site that had the selection they were seeking. So they built their own. And now Tipsy ships to 41 states and counting in the U.S. Looking for the perfect Father's Day gift for the dad in your life? Give him a Tipsy Flight Club subscription and update his bar cart with some unique finds. Send him a monthly one-bottle box for $69 or a quarterly three-bottle box for $189, featuring spirits from his favorite category or mixed categories. And from June 1st through August 31st, you get 10% off all orders at tipsy.com with code COCKTAILGURU. That's T-I-P-X-Y dot com. Tipsy. Sip something new. Okay, here he is, Kevin. Welcome. Kevin Beery, welcome. Hey, guys. How are you? Fine, thanks. Thanks for joining us for all the way from Chicago. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. And you've, yes. got, you've got a really nice background. Um, your, it's the bar uh, and your beautiful back bar with many different spirits. Do you have, uh, what do you have back there? Are those rums and agave? Uh, yeah, behind me currently is all rum. Uh, on the all top rum, shelf okay, is all really inde- independent bottlers. And then the bottom shelf is a mix of Barbados, Guyana, uh, St. Lucia, a couple more independent bottlers. <laughs> And uh, we, we always well, ask our guests um, at the beginning of each session, what is, Kevin, your desert island drink? Yeah, I think, you know, after all these years and all the cocktails, I think it's probably just a, a split-based daiquiri of, uh, of some sort. Uh, definitely one portion of overproof rum. I think that if you're, you know, I always picture a desert island, island being this I, idyllic tropical place. So uh, a nice, strong rum daiquiri is kind of where I'm at. And split base, what is the uh, other base for that? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I would say it's going to be all rum. Um, oh, all rum. So say, two different Yeah, no, rums, yeah, exactly. Styles, Ideally, yeah. I'd okay. probably do like a over, overproof uh, Jamaican white rum and then some, uh, some probably some fresh cane juice rum, maybe a Martinique rum agricole oh, yeah. um, or some, something a little bit on the funky side. Yum. That does sound really delicious. Um, Kevin, how'd you... Um, How'd you get into this uh, wild and wacky business that we call hospitality? Uh, for me, it was, uh, you know, my going to school, going to college, um, needed a part-time job. And, uh, you know, when I was 18, I was in Philly. And, you know, at the time you could bartend at 18 in, in Pennsylvania. So uh, got behind a bar and turned into more of a full-time scenario and kind of never looked back. And here we are 19 years later. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to, I, I'd like to focus in a little bit on, uh, rum and sort of the popular, I, I mean, agave is extremely popular, a bit saturated, uh, rum. What, what is your opinion on sort of where we are today in the bar world, uh, as it pertains to the category of rum? Yeah, I would say in the last 10 years, it's really come a long way. I was, it's almost night and day. I mean, the, the products that you see on, on your average back bar now from a, a, a rum perspective are completely different than you saw 10 years ago. So, and, and mostly for the better. Um, I would say the prolification of, of quality rum, um, you've definitely seen sort of this massive category of flavored rums, uh, unaged flavored rums sort of fall off. And, and we're finally really starting to see regular placements of good quality rum at a good value. Well, and you've got an incredible selection of rum. I, I, I just can't get over it. I, I was trying to call it up here because I, I did go over the whole list and it's divided between um, sugarcane based uh, rums and uh, molasses based rums and those that are uh, column still or pot still created. Um, it's really quite a sophisticated and extensive selection of what looks to be some fantastic rum. Yeah, and, and our focus has been on the quality. You know, there was a while where we just, you know, would would take every rum that was available and put it on the shelf. And then the, the category has grown to a point right. that, you know, we 
it just made more sense to focus in on on rums we consider of quality. So there are certain categories we sort of just ignore um, and go a little bit deeper on others. But in general, sort of our mantra is that, uh, you know, we carry rums of quality that we can be proud of and sort of leave leave everything else by the wayside. And going back to the traditions of uh, Trader Vic and Don the Beachcomber, you have Jay Ray and Nephew, 15-year-old. Correct. Uh, we do. We have one bottle of uh, yeah. Jay Ray Nephew's 15 year old. Um, it uh, is about to go on the menu in the bamboo room in a um, uh, what we're going to try to do as the as a very accurate 1944 style Mai Tai. So, um, I, you know, ideally we would have the Ray Nephew 17, but it is, you know, so few bottles remain and, and the same for the 15. Um, but we're recreating the 44 Mai Tai with uh, the Ray Nephew 15. Uh, as well as a bottle of Curacao that we um, tracked down from the 40s. Uh, that's a nice wow. dry French Curacao. So I think you wow. know we're gonna we're gonna come pretty close. It's gonna we have 12 Mai Tais to make, um, sort of in the you know 1944 vintage style, and uh, yeah, it's gonna be pretty exciting to start putting those together. John, please book me a ticket to Chicago for this afternoon. Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, I'm booking it right now. Um, I'm I'm there. I want. I, I'm serious. Yeah, I really yeah. want to go to Chicago. Well, to, well, I was there to visit Three Dots and a Dash. So I visited Three Dots. Um, I don't remember what year you opened. Was it like 2014, 2015? Um, Three Dots Ooh. opened in July of 2013. Uh, 2013. I came on. Yeah. I came on board in 2015. Okay. Yeah. So, so I and think the bamboo, I, the bamboo room, 2019. That's right. So. Yeah. Yeah. So I was yeah. there um, when Paul McGee was still there. Um, amazing uh, human being. And I don't know if it was in the first year or the second year of opening, but um, I remember hearing that um, on weekends or on your busiest nights, I don't know if this is the case anymore. And I don't even remember the exact number, but it was an insane number of cocktails that you churn out on any given busy night. Is that is that true? Yeah, I mean, uh, definitely the pace picked up a lot since those first years. Um, but our highest selling days we've done up to about twenty five hundred cocktails. Twenty five hundred cocktails. Mm -hmm. And do you? Um, what is your system with cocktail making? Is everything done a la minute? Are there some things that are batched? Um, is are there? Yeah. How, yeah. So um, the full breakdown of the program, we. Um, we have four fully batched cocktails that are prepared every morning and held on um, uh, in a, on a nitrogen system. Um, and generally, so that'll be be just four four cocktails there that are fully composed. And then from there, we'll uh, batch together the base spirits of the remaining cocktails. And that's just going to be, you know, spirit based. There's no sugar, uh, syrup, cordial um, or juice sort of in that base. And then uh, the cocktails are produced from there. So you know, you have four fully, fully batched. And then there's, uh, you know, another, um, you know, including the large format drinks, another 25, 30 or so um, cocktails that are produced uh, a la minute. Um, you know, we try to keep them in the in the range of under 10 touches of cocktail, but tiki drinks can be uh, fairly, fairly complex in composition. So Really, the batching is just to sort of speed things up and uh, eliminate some strain on the bartender with those extra touches. Well, and you are in the process now of revamping your cocktail list at the Bamboo Room. Uh, Bamboo Room just put out its uh, its summer mm -hmm. uh, menu uh, just this past mm -hmm. week. Um, so really, really great menu. We uh, worked on this one for a while, so some great stuff there. Uh, Three Dots and Dash will be featuring uh, its new menu for the summer in May. Uh, this coming July is our 10th anniversary. So uh, for our summer mm -hmm. menu, where a portion of it's going to be, you know, sort of the the greatest hits of 10 years. So sort of a cocktail from, from each year of the program, um, highlighting sort of what was popular at the time. So it's going to be a fun look back on uh, many years of Three Dots. Well, congratulations! Oh, thanks. How many bartender? How many bartenders do you have in the between the bamboo room and three dots? Uh, we keep anywhere between like thirteen, fifteen on the on the full time roster. Yeah, that that's what I would think. That's an extensive crew you have there for sure. Pretty deep crew. And and I and I would think that is absolutely necessary. Looking at at the intricate and sophisticated complex cocktails that you have. Yeah, I mean, at any, really, any given time, at at really beautiful at full peak, there is seven bartenders making drinks at the same time. 
Wow. wow. And, and what does your sort of training program look like uh, for new hires? I, I would assume that, I mean, I would assume that it's pretty, you, you need to be pretty extensive and there needs to be a lot of practice and apprenticeship. And wait a, wait a second, Morse code is required, correct? <laughs> Uh, Morse code's not a requirement. I mean, you got to know the basics <laughs> to be able to explain the name of the bar. But um, yeah, I mean, training for us, um, you know, we do have the luxury in that uh, the way our bar is oriented, we have a main bar in the front of the house that has three wells, and three, three to four bartenders producing drinks. And then we have uh, a two well service bar in the back of the house. So um, starting out bartending at three dots, um, while you're learning all your recipes, and you're really getting all your motions down, you're able to do that without having a, a whole bar full of guests sitting in front of you, or in our case, standing in front of you, shouting drink orders at you. Um, so, you know, that, that takes a little bit of the strain away on, on getting started as a bartender at three dots. Um, you know, we'll focus to begin with sort of, you got to get down all the cocktails that are on the menu. And then we dive into sort of the, the basics of rum, and then we'll get into a more advanced tasting of rum. And then from there, sort of, you know, trying to, to garner an understanding of, um, you know, tiki tropical cocktail history and sort of how these cocktails are concerned and sort of, you know, um, increasing a bartender sort of Rolodex of these off menu tropical cocktails they can go to. And um, when, uh, and your, your garnishes, I mean, I think you, you, you have pretty extensive garnishes. Was I correct when I said that you do a, a little dolphin garnish? Is that, is that uh, yeah. True, what, once just... upon a time we did, uh, okay. I would say <laughs> till about maybe 20, late 2015, 20, early 2016. Uh, okay. We were we were so making the, that uh, banana garnish. So the dolphin is gone. Uh, yeah, you may. I don't know. You know, I can't reveal too much yet, but you may be oh. making a uh, surprise appearance for Ooh, our ten year anniversary menu. Oh, and and mm. in the in the eight years that you've been there, Kevin, um, have you seen your guests' tastes uh, change or uh, evolve since since the beginning? Because when Three Dots opened, you were really one of the few uh, resurgence or resurfaced tiki bars um, that kind of came on when the tiki craze came back to us uh, here in the States. Um, and I assume, you know, there have been tastes that have evolved or devolved or, or what, but what have you seen with your, uh, with your guests? Yeah, I would say, you know, sort of when I came on board, the drinks were um, certainly very spirit forward and bold. Um, and I think that was sort of our mentality for a number of years after that. Um, and then I would say there was sort of, uh, you know, an interest in maybe uh, a little bit greater balance in cocktails and that the necessity for really, really spirit forward cocktails, you know, wasn't the primary objective. Um, you know, once, once people really started getting adjusted to, to tropical drinks, I think they started to more so appreciate the nuance. Um, we started to get more creative with, you know, bringing other flavors and influences into the framework of tropical cocktails. So, you know, there's, there's no doubt been a huge evolution and we're very much appreciating that as we're, you know, kind of looking through all the menus over the last 10 years to, to come up with this greatest hits is it's pretty clear kind of how, how things have sort of evolved to a, a more balanced and delicious tropical drink over that time. And I think, you know, the, interest in other spirits too. I mean, you know, so many tropical drinks are focused on rum, uh, but the consumer definitely has an interest in exploring outside of that. I would say, you know, we, we see the trends of the greater cocktail movement sort of um, seep their way into tropical cocktails. So I think, you know, the, some of the current ones, like the, the big agave boom right now is, you know, just as, as prevalent in our world that you have a huge uh, segment of your consumer that is very interested in sticking with agave spirits and we can make drink tropical cocktails with some agave spirits so they're you know we're always sort of um sprinkling in some of some current trends into sort of our vision of tropical cocktails it seems to me that your cocktails if i may be so bold as to say are a subtler more sophisticated version of tiki cocktails yeah no doubt i mean when you when you take yeah. all the learnings of of sort of the, the modern uh, classic cocktail movement, um, and you sort of apply them into the the realm of, of tropical cocktails. You come up with more balanced and, and nuanced result. There's there's no doubt. And I, I want to take a quick break and talk a little bit more about building blocks of uh, tiki cocktails when we come right back. 
Hey everyone, Jonathan here. If you're into swag as much as we are, then look no further than our Cocktail Guru Shop. The items in our store have been personally chosen, handpicked with care by me, I'm Jonathan, and my team of Cocktail Gurus. A water bottle with a stainless steel straw? Yep. T-shirts? Mm-hmm. Hoodies? The snapback hats, signed copies of Mr. Boston Bartender's Guide, cocktail box kits, bar tools, and more. You betcha. We've even managed to create a onesie for that mocktail lover in your family. So head on over to shop.cocktailguru.com and use code GURU23 for 10% off your first order. Great deal. That's shop.thecocktailguru.com, 10% off with code GURU23. Cheers. And now we're back. Um, Kevin, you were talking about how you see your guests uh, being a little bit more experimental with tiki cocktails and maybe changing out the base spirit here and there. Um, is there sort of a formula or a, a, a classic formula for tiki cocktails and, and what constitutes a tiki cocktail? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of recorded um, recipes or, or you know, uh, sort of the canon of tiki cocktails and tropical cocktails is pretty well documented, right? So there, there's hundreds and hundreds of recipes. Um, and I would say there's certainly some common threads through that. There's sort of this common, uh, certain, to an extent, a common palette of, of flavors and ingredients um, that you kind of see weaved throughout. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that kind of answers your question. We definitely, you know, there's some uh, standby techniques and ingredients, um, you know, and a, lo a lot of opportunities for sort of, subbing in those those new and interesting flavors and spirits yeah i mean you're, you're kind of going um as far as uh cocktail the architecture uh the building blocks of a drink tiki i mean you're really starting off with in a way a classic rum sour and then you're adding in um another al alternative tropical ingredient pineapple guava mango whatever whatever that may be um and not only the liquid portion of the drink, but also the ice, the glass, and the garnish, right? Yeah, for sure. And I think that's where, you know, you you identify some of those building blocks. Um, obviously, a lot of crushed ice, a lot of bright acids, um, a lot of tropical flavors from, like you were saying, passion fruit, guava, mango, sort of things in, in that framework. Um, from a garnish perspective, I think you know, a, a well done tropical drink expresses its ingredients and its freshness through its garnish. So it's important to pick up on the flavors you're putting in the cocktail and its garnish. Um, and then creative glassware um, in the form of custom ceramic mugs and sort of large and interesting footed and shaped glassware have sort of always been a, a standard. Dad, you and I love going to the Mai Kai, Tiki the Mai, the Mai Kai yes. specifically. Have yes, you been there, do. Kevin? The Mai Kai in Fort Lauderdale. Oh yeah, sure, sure have. Yeah. yeah, and at the Mai Kai, you know, I mean, that's that's like classic 1940s, 50s, 60s Polynesian um, food and drink. Um, and I, I I just love that kind of vibe. And um, you know, you guys, the vibe of three dots and a dash for those people who aren't there. Can you kind of describe? Um, what that might be. I mean, I know that you have classic influences in there, but you have some new age stuff. Yeah. So I would say like, you know, three dots is very much a modern interpretation of, of all of those classic movements. It's, it's taken design cues from that, but in a very, I would say almost like clean, more sophisticated way. Um, and that I think goes, you know, goes into our menu design, it goes into the style of cocktails. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely we we uh, take that influence, uh, and you know, you have the luxury of, of when you're evaluating such a, a storied piece of cocktail history, like kind of cherry picking the best parts and creating what you want the tr modern tropical bar to look like. Yeah, something that has always bothered me. Uh oh, John. Uh -oh here I it never is. discussed here this with you about about here tiki. What? Yeah, it's 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 an issue that I have read about. But I've never really discussed it, certainly not on the podcast I haven't, nope. not even with you. Nope. And that's the concept of frozen cocktails, uh -huh. frozen tiki cocktails. Yes. And the reason I bring that up is because I'm not reading about Trader Vic and reading about Don the Beachcomber. There may have very well been frozen cocktails served in those restaurants. I, I don't know. Are you saying, what are you saying? Are you saying that you've 
you have not read any frozen, uh, you know, of, of any frozen cocktails at their places? No, I'm saying that I have. Oh, you have? Yes. Oh, oh, okay. It appears, it appears ah. so when reading um, Don the Beachcomber's daughter's book on the subject. It, it seems as though there may have been some frozen cocktails mm. or semi-frozen. Yeah, I mean, drinks. Don the Beachcomber definitely had some recipes that were fully, fully blended in a blender. You know, they're yeah, often referred right. to as sort of like the right. flash blend, but... Um, I think one of the most popular examples is probably Missionary's Downfall, uh, mm -hmm. which was blended mm -hmm. with fresh mint, pineapple, green chartreuse. Well, green chartreuse is our addition, but, um, oh. you know, it's definitely of a, a frozen consistency. Yeah. And the uh, the wearing blender had just come out. Yeah. Had recently. Yeah, no, I think, and, I think you see yeah. examples of, yes, the um, immersion stick blender, but also sort of your more conventional blade bladed blender as well so there was i would say oh yeah very yeah. likely i don't think it was to the extent of like the fully thick frozen pina colada coming out of a, a frozen drink machine but i think there was definitely uh, right. some some fully blended elements um yeah in, in cocktails of the era for sure yeah mm. well this well, i mean it's I'm making, glad we got that straightened it's out making, yeah, it's making me thirsty i mean i'm i'm not i don't have a tiki drink in front of me but um here going, John. okay thanks here mm. yeah Okay, cheers. Great. Cheers. A, a quick question for you, Kevin. Um, with restaurants and hospitality opening back up and various challenges that operators are running into, is there any particular challenge? I know that some are saying, you know, that staffing is a challenge and retention and pay and all of that stuff. But is there anything um, that, that comes to mind for you going on these days? Yeah, I mean, honestly, a lot of those things have somewhat alleviated. Um, okay, that's you know, good. I would say, you know, in in from what I've heard, kind of in major cities, um, you know, staffing has, is not too much of a challenge. I think it, you know, workplaces have changed a lot, and if if you haven't adapted to that through all of this, then I think, yeah, you're potentially you're going to have a, a harder time hiring staff. Um, but luckily, we've seen seen a lot of that sort of uh, resolve itself. You know, I think a lot of lessons were learned. Um, you know, a lot of people did decide that it was a time for, for them to leave the industry and, and, um, you know, understandably so. Um, but yeah, we're, we're glad to sort of, uh, definitely be, uh, seeing the, seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And you guys serve food, um, over there at three dots. You do, oh, right? Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. I was looking, I was looking at the beautiful dishes, the photographs of them. There's a Great looking poo poo platter. Yeah, like you know, little little yeah. small bites and dishes that are uh, good to accompany strong cocktails. Was is the, kind of the idea. But I um, I also wanted to talk about quickly the fact what you were saying before of people wanting cocktails that are not necessarily as spirit forward as before. Do you think that is kind of just an overall moderation of alcohol intake and sort of you know. Um, you know, obviously you've got the low ABV and no ABV trends. Is that kind of making its way into Tiki, do you think? Oh, definitely. Um, you know, even to the point that, you know, we always now keep a uh, alcohol-free cocktail on our menu and, and the popularity mm -hmm. of it is, is staggering, right? You know, there's so many occasions wow. where, you know, you're in a social setting with a group and for some reason or another, you just don't want to be consuming. And I think Potentially, even as you get a little bit older, you have more and more of those circumstances pop up um, where just, you know, moderation is, is going to going to serve you well. Um, you know, and I think that that, you know, sort of the younger guests that are coming in, you know, are certainly more conscious of that. But I think it's it's not limited to one sort of age range or generation. I think just in general, the sort of the acceptability of, of being a little bit more moderate, but yet still going out and having a good time and being social are, are definitely being embraced. And, uh, I'm here for it. I uh, I think it's a, a great addition, um, especially in the world of tropical drinks. You know, these drinks can be so strong and so overwhelming, and overindulging on them can really uh, be regrettable. So I'm I'm definitely happy to see a little bit more moderation. Zombie, anyone? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it's you have that in the spectrum, like right. If you want to get ripped, yeah. like this is the place to come. But I also want it to be <laughs> a place that, uh, if you want to be a little bit more more responsible, you could do that too. You have a do you have a limit mm -hmm. on the number of zombies someone can order? 
Uh, <laughs> I mean, we keep a close eye. I have a very uh, talented and, and well-trained staff. So, um, you know, we, we certainly know the signs to be looking out for because we don't want to see anybody get themselves in too much trouble. Um, and there are drinks that just are overwhelmingly strong. And, and I think one thing about tropical drinks is uh, they do a very good job of, of balancing those those strong rums and spirits with you know these light and bright delicious balanced tropical flavors and they can really creep up on you sometimes yeah it says only one per customer on this menu yeah no that was the that was definitely that? sort yeah. of a, a classic uh tropical bar thing was to sort of have these mm-hmm. uh yeah. limits that that you know i think somewhat served as a warning but also somewhat served as a, a sales tactic right you see this one per customer oh, somebody, somebody oh yeah you know, and of yeah. course that's the first you thing want you want more to do is try to drink <laughs> yeah <food. laughs> Right. Well, unfortunately, at Don the Beachcomber's place in Hollywood, uh, Howard Hughes had more than one, overindulged a bit, and got into a lot of trouble. Oh. Oh, yeah. boy. But we won't go into detail. <laughs> no, I guess not. Well, even though I know the gory details. Okay. No, 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 no. We're not going to go into that. Um, but uh, this has been a really nice, uh, lovely conversation, Kevin. And we really appreciate your time. Thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. It was my pleasure. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Kevin. And there's a lot more to talk about. I know there should be a part two because I have more questions yeah, I know. that I haven't been able to get to. Well, thanks. well you know where to find me. Yeah. Yes, I do. Thank you. Tipple Time is brought to you in part by Perfect Puree of Napa Valley. Jonathan here with another segment, Tipple Time. Hope you've been enjoying this episode of the Cocktail Guru Podcast. Uh, I'm joining you again here from my home kitchen. I thought I would make you a beer-inspired cocktail. I love working with beer and cocktails. Obviously, beer is delicious on its own. Well, most beer, not all beer, but this will actually zhuzh it up or jazz it up a little bit. Of course, using another one of my favorite fruit blends from Perfect Puree of Napa Valley. This is their mango passion. Oh my goodness. It's so good too. Um, And then I'm using a lager style beer and that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, that is it. I have my pint glass here and I'm going to add some ice to the glass. You'll see how simple this is in just a moment. And the uh, mango passion from Perfect Puree will just go right in there. I'm just kind of eyeballing about an ounce and a half. Yum. And just topping it off with my lager style beer and the lager style beer and the puree together add this really really nice um well a mango color (laughs) it's basically all i can say about that and it looks really nice it makes you want to drink it and actually you'll be able to drink a couple of these it's low alcohol low abv um it's definitely a trend and i've got a lemon wheel that i'm just going to place on top like this smell you get the lager you get mango and passion and lemon i love that i love that combination cheers Mm. what does that remind me of that reminds me of i don't know like sitting down at an outdoor concert (laughs) and enjoying the music and enjoying the weather and enjoying a nice ice cold beverage in my hand that has this sort of tropical beer notes to it well that about does it cheers everyone until next time Triple Time is brought to you in part by Perfect Puree of Napa Valley. On the next Cocktail Guru podcast, it sounds yummy. Yeah. It sounds almost like dessert. It's like a grown-up Coca-Cola. You could, you could pour that over ice cream. Absolutely. Yeah. I, knew you were, you I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. That does it for today's show. If you enjoy what we do, please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. You can also support the show with a small monthly donation to help sustain future episodes. Just click on the donate button at the top of our website and choose your donation amount. To learn more about our guests, visit www.thecocktailgurupodcast.com or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The Cocktail Guru Podcast is produced by First Real Entertainment and distributed by Eats Drinks TV, a service of the Center for Culinary Culture, home of the Cocktail Collection, and is available via Anchor, Spotify, Apple, Google, Amazon, and wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 